Hello and welcome to session five, I think this is, for the Community Health and Wellbeing Practitioner. Um, last time we were together, we were looking at uh, the tools to do things like managing social prescribing, looking at strategies to managing stress. Let's pop that light on so you can get a nice bit of shine on my face so I look more alive. Um, and we were looking at coping skills, resilience, etc., and other tools. So let's go to our site and go straight in. So in duty two, we're looking at helping communities build local resilience, identifying strength, looking at capacity and resources uh, that support health and well-being. So let's jump straight into this. Um, so here then, we're looking at uh, how we engage with communities and the assessments for that. Uh, and identifying local strengths and resources is a real key thing for a community health and wellbeing practitioner. So understanding who your organisations are uh, within your area. So um, your local groups, support groups, churches, voluntary groups, uh, such as your third sector charity organisations. Uh, and it's worthwhile you spending a little bit of time to understand who the organisations are and how they can best meet your service or your needs. Um, you know, and it's not necessarily just thinking about the individuals in which you're looking after. You need to think about staff and well-being, so people that you work with, they need they may need people to talk to, uh, but also family members. Yeah. So thinking about how you can identify those services uh, that can manage all of um, those areas. Equally, it may not just be resources around mental health and well-being. You could be looking at things around social prescribing, uh, around um, community. Uh, so that could be things such as housing, uh, debt management or um, food. So try to sort those out. Um, you're obviously going to be looking at building up your knowledge and skills banks uh, as well as the local community because raising awareness and psychoeducation is a key skill uh, for anyone that works within health education. So having clear uh, education and training resources here would be great. Um, and especially when we think about uh, health and social care and we think about end of life care, for example, we know that everyone goes through that grief cycle. Um, and part of your service should be, look, here's some information, advice and guidance about um, how we manage uh, the end of life process. So it's great to give family members information about the end of life process, uh, to understand what the dying stages look like, to understand the processes on how we verify uh, somebody who's passed away, uh, to look at the steps in releasing the body so it can be sent to the undertakers. Uh, and then obviously this complicated piece around closing down the estate of a deceased person. Uh, and we have charities and organisations out there that can do that. So we have Bereavement UK. Um, there is a service called Tell Us Once. So there's lots of uh, sound bites and nuggets of information out there that actually as a community health and well-being practitioner you could bring this together within your role and have information about it all um and and you know let's think about dementia as well so if you're in a care service and you're looking after people with cognitive impairments um a that's difficult for the individual but b that's even harder for the family members so providing with good resources such as um, Dementia Friends, uh, Alzheimer's UK, um, and understanding their rights and the support networks and, and trying to get them a dementia nurse uh, assigned to them. Uh, and no different to cancer as well. If we think about cancer patients, how distressing that is for the individual and for the family, looking at those resources. Um, and it's not just them. The now, we then got the end of life stages as well to think about in that full planning. So all of that needs to be taken into account when we look at capacity building, when we look at providing uh, additional support around mental health um, for our services or for the community. 
Uh, resource mobilisation within the community is very much the case that there are resources there uh, within the community. Um, and we need to have a far better understanding within our localization about what we have. Now, there is a service called the Hub of Hope. So it's in your toolkit that I've given you at the top. You pop your postcode in and everything around that service or everything around that condition tells you all the services that are there. But equally, if we think about somebody, let's just say we've got a patient and, and they've gained a lot of weight because of their depression. We've got multiple things going on here, haven't we? We've got depression, we've got weight gain and obesity, that's putting the patient at risk of cardiac problems, um, they could be at risk of strokes. They're gonna need support around eating well, um, sleeping well, um, you know, physical movement. So there are individual organizations all across the country that do all of these little bits. So when we think about plan and our resources our interventions you having a list of those services is great but remember health and well-being isn't just a nine to five thing it isn't it is a 24 hour thing and i would say in my experience mental health peaks out of hours and at weekends because that's when you can't access resources so when we think about our resources, if we think about referring people to crisis CAFs or walk-in centres or this lot, there is equally an abundance of resources online. So you've got things such as, um, I'm just trying to think, Samaritans, which is 24 hours. There's Paralysis, or, uh, which is 24 hours. There's um, something about um there's a hub that's 24 hours so again if you go back to your toolkits i've given you all of these additional charities and organizations that do out of our calls some do weekends some do evenings but if you can try and find this and again go back to education training create a resource sheet for the people which you look after um, then you're giving them the resources to promote their independence, keep them empowered and crisis manage and keep them safe. Um, and again, monitoring and evaluating your community local resilience and identifying those strengths. Um, you can measure success, can't you, by the, the drop of suicide rates or how busy those charities and organisations sectors are, whether or not you're having less referrals to primary and secondary care. Because again, as we keep saying throughout of all this training, we need to stop over medicalizing social care problems. Uh, unfortunately, there isn't a pill for everything. Um, you know, medication isn't going to help debt management. Medication isn't going to help homelessness. What helps those people are good resources um, and organizations that understand um, the situations that people are in. Um, and finally, then, looking at rostering, uh, collaboration and social um, sharing. It's important that we work across uh, other organisations to look at um, sharing the resources that we all have and working together. So creating some kind of network there to, to show this continual support. Now, as I always say, your behaviours for your apprenticeship isn't something that you should be doing just for this module. It's something you should be doing all of the time. So seek to collaborate with individuals, communities and organisations across sectors uh, and cultural boundaries. is isn't something you should just be doing at once. It's something we should be doing continually. But again, if we truly immerse ourselves in community, we can't help but come across cultural boundaries because within our local community, we're gonna have several different uh, faiths. So you may come across Christians and Catholics and Muslims, and Jehovah Witnesses. So automatically <clears throat> you're reducing the stigma for mental health and physical health with those charities and organizations. Um, so it's things that you should be doing all the time. But anyway, for this standard, we are looking at um, seeking collaboration across boundaries. Uh, and that collaboration looks at uh, with individuals. So again, we should be working with a diverse range of individuals to understand what each individual's bar uh, barrier and boundary is. 
Remember, different cultures will have different belief systems. They'll have different belief systems towards the end of life stages. So um, if you're Muslim, perhaps you've got to be um, passed over within 24 hours, Jewish, etc. So just think about how you're going to manage that within your organisation. Um, how you'll collaborate with the committee. So working closely with those different groups. What is it you're trying to get out of them? Is, is it collaboration? Is it joint working? Is it resources? Um, maybe it's contingency planning. Maybe you've got uh, some crisis management or safety planning that you think could work. Um, you know, churches make a great place for safety planning. So if you've got somebody who is suicidal, finding a church where they could go to, to maybe pray or, or seek help, maybe better than presenting to an A&E department. Um, so just understanding people's culture and belief systems <clears throat> is kind of key to helping them um, staying safe. And, and again, and collaborating with organisations, understanding organisations' points of referral. So, for example, uh, Change, Grow, Live, that deal with addiction, their referral process is that anyone in primary healthcare can do a referral, but you can self-refer. And nine out of 10 times, the organizations prefer self-referrals because it shows that commitment to recovery. Um, again, looking at building trust and understanding, again, building trust is, is a difficult concept because it, it's a value-based uh, however, we can use social norms for this. We can look at what trust should look like, meaning if you say you're going to call somebody back, call them back. If you know someone's going through a difficult time or, or they're finding transitions hard, have the empathy and try and um, help them to navigate our complex systems. Um, and that might just be the case of giving them a phone number or an email or just reassurance. Or if somebody's going through a treatment process, explaining that treatment process to them in an accessible information that they understand. So if their cognition is racing or they're not able to take things in, maybe what you need to do is give them a little bit of information and then in a couple of days call them and discuss everything with them. But if you want to build trust with individuals, you need to ensure that you follow through. Uh, remember, building trust takes a lot of time. To break trust, it takes one act of incompetence. Um, so bear that in mind when you are trying to build those therapeutic relationships. Um, and then leveraging collaborative strengths. So again, creating and combining skills and resources across your organisation and within the local community. So the skills required then are about building partnerships and connections with local people and local groups um, and reaching out. Now, the only way that you're really going to do that is by getting out there and doing it. You know, do a website search, walk up and down your high street, look at the organisations, um, go to your community boards. Uh, you'll be surprised what's in uh, the co-op normally has a community board. Have a read of what's on there in the local shops you know have a look at your local newspapers look at the organizations and charities that are in your area because you'll identify then what you need for points of referral for your local people um you'll be able to engage local people in groups and organizations so equally if you're engaged with all of these other organizations for your services what could they do for your service is it the fact that maybe somebody from oxfam could come in and do a speech uh, to to um, your residents, maybe you could have somebody from the Red Cross come in and do hand care. So the activities, the engagement is a two way process from a care service point of view. There are things that you are going to be able to do for them and there are things that they can do for you. And that's that collaboration in which we're talking about sharing the resources that we already have rather than creating new resources. That moves on to partnership building. Again, the only way that you're going to build partnerships is by reaching out, by networking. Um, I remember when I started my role down as um, a primary healthcare nurse, I didn't really know anybody in the local area. And I was doing some referrals and the referrals kept getting rejected. Uh, and that caused me a bit of frustration because I'm trying 
to provide care and treatment for the people that I'm looking after. Uh, and then I've got people above me rejecting my applications. So I remember ringing up the department uh, that's responsible for this. And I said to them, you know, can I come down and speak to the person that's responsible for my applications? And they said, oh, yeah, come in. So I, so I went down and I spoke to them and I said, to them, Look, you know, tell me, tell me, what is it that I'm doing wrong? What is it that you need for me to get these people across that threshold? And by me doing that, I built local connections. You know, I met the manager of the service. I understood how the service worked. I understood the team. And that then helped me then refer people quicker. I had less dropouts and less frustration. So partnership building is something that you've got to actively want to do and promote. The problem is most people sit behind the desks and they don't want to get involved in other organisations and that gets very frustrating for the person where care is meant to be wrapped around them because then they feel that they've got to co coordinate their care. So ultimately, build those partnerships reduces the, the pressure on the individual in which we're meant to be providing care services for. Equally, we're meant to have shared visions and goals. So going back to your service looking at what it is this community health and well-being practitioners role can contribute towards your service look at your visions and goals and i bet somewhere on your goals it's all about empowering people it's all about promoting independence it's all about autonomy well you can't give people autonomy unless you're giving them information you need to give them the information to make informed choices so if you haven't given the information to make informed choices, how have they got autonomy? How are they empowered to live their life? So go back to your, your values and your goals, have a look at those shared visions and make sure that what you're saying in your statements of purpose and your service user guides, that you're living by that. And this role, as far as I'm concerned, is what will help drive that visions and goal through because as a community health and wellbeing practitioner, you're able to be that person that brings it all together and connects it all. Um, <clears throat> again, leveraging on resources and assets. So understanding capacity within the area is really important. Um, a lot of the time when you are in a, um, a, a residential setting or a nursing setting, you ring up, you say, can I speak to the doctor? They go, no, uh, they'll have to be put on the ward round for next week. Um, or you ring up community health and community health is busy. By understanding their capacity, by understanding what their barriers are, you're then able to provide more solutions your side. So there's no point already leaning on an overstretched service. Surely as a service, what you should be doing is looking at other organisations that can provide a similar service uh, and see if they've got more resources. So if you've got a GP or a pharmacist that's completely drowning, does it not make sense that we look elsewhere? Maybe we look at a different pharmacist. Maybe we use an online pharmacist uh, and free up some of the community shops for uh, local people, and then we can go elsewhere. So I just want us to think about the resources and the assets we've got, um, because... I tend to see when I go out to care homes and care services that they're moaning about how slow everyone is, but then they're not prepared to change their ideology or their way of thinking or to try something new. And the problem is all of our resources that we're using currently is overstretched. So unless we start looking at being more flexible as organisations, it's going to be very difficult for organisations to keep up with demand. So again, just thinking about, well, what can I do? How can I get things a bit quicker? Um, so equally, by using an online pharmacist, maybe for your medication, that's going to, you know, that will take the pressure off your local community. Um, so just, you know, problem solve, I guess, is where we're going with that. Part of your role is to think a bit more um, critically uh, and, and try to identify some solutions. Equally, your role within the, the uh, community health and wellbeing practitioners role is about monitoring, evaluation and continual quality improvement. So with everything that you're doing, is it making a difference? Are you improving the quality of life? If you're looking towards, again, as we said in that example, the dying stages, 
have you got evidence that you can show maybe CQC or your local authority that the service that you've provided has actually improved the quality of the delivery? So collecting feedback from your stakeholders, from the people in which you're looking after, including um, family members and everyone else, you can then pull together this data and, and look at what's working and what's not working. Um, what I tend to say to a lot of people, if it's not broken, don't fix it. But look at the areas that are broken and fix that. Don't go for the easy wins and those low hanging fruits. Go for where the problems really are a problem and try to work across your local community and across other organizations to resolve that as a problem. Um, and by working in a much more responsible way, in a much more networking, outreaching way, you're going to eventually build trust um, and relationships. And when you build trust and relationships as a community health and wellbeing practitioner, you'll be able to get help quicker for people. Um, I remember when I graduated as a nurse, the one thing that I enjoyed about my, my registration was I could talk about a patient and I knew that somebody was listening and I could get that person the help a bit quicker. And that's where we're going with these qualifications. We want to build your knowledge and skills up around health and wellbeing, where you can identify risk, you can evaluate risk, you can make recommendations for improvements, and those improvements will ultimately have better outcomes for the individuals. Um, and the more you do that, the more you'll be respected, the more trust you'll build, uh, and then eventually you'll be in a situation where you'll talk to your doctor and the doctor will be saying to you, Look, what do you need? Just let me know. Uh, and that's a great position to be in. S7 looks at working with and supporting and supervising people, working as volunteers, uh, whilst recognising the boundaries of their roles. So part of the community health and wellbeing practitioner, as we've, we've spoken about earlier, is about using resources. Volunteers are a great resource. Now, obviously, if we're going to use resources in health and social care, they still have to go through the same DBS process, uh, the same clearing process and the same recruitment selection process. But we saw during COVID that that was possible. We saw when all these volunteers stepped up to give injections, we saw how quickly we could get things done. And when we think about services, services are stretched. So understanding how we can use volunteers within our companies and organizations, you know, when we look at hospitals, hospitals are run by volunteers. They've got lots of volunteers. They've got volunteers doing uh, care navigation. When you walk through the first door of the hospital, you've normally got volunteers there. You've got volunteers in the shop, volunteers coming around with the, the tea trolley and the magazine trolley things that are trying to improve the quality of people's lives. And there's no reason why we can't have volunteers in care services. When the pandemic hit, I was a registered manager uh, and we asked for volunteers and we had volunteers come in. They donated stuff to our charity shop and I had volunteers making face masks for our staff. The reality is it's your innovation, your problem solving skills, that's gonna help meet the needs of the organization here. Equally, if you have volunteers, you need to respect them, make sure that they're supported and supervised uh, and, and make sure that they work within clear boundaries. Um, so they understand their roles and responsibilities. We, we, you know, we don't necessarily want them making clinical decisions, um, but there's absolutely no reason why they can't monitor things. Um, you know, especially if we're doing end of life work, maybe you've got a volunteer that will just come in and hold somebody's hand and just talk to them for an hour. Um, you know, there are volunteers in the Red Cross, there's volunteers in St. John's Ambulance. There are organisations out there where people want to train up to work in healthcare. And yet we're not using them. We're not using them within our services of health and social care. So where we're so heavily stretched, we could be working with volunteers to help bridge some of these um, holes that we've got. Equally looking at their, their growth and their development, uh, we need to have those, uh, we need to be flexible with our volunteers, um, you know, except the fact that uh, everyone's got different interests and, and try to be adaptable to those um, and make sure that you have a, a way of monitoring them uh, and that you can evaluate what they're doing. 
But when we look at it, using volunteers within our services, we need to be thinking about, well, what, what could they contribute? So think about just things like maybe doing a tea run, a, you know, a, a cake bake, um, and, and doing activities, maybe doing worships and prayers, maybe just doing talking therapy, maybe they're doing some kind of hand massage. There are so many ways in which we could use volunteers. We just don't use it enough uh, within our sector. Uh, Recognise whether non statutory and community and voluntary groups and services are safe and sustainable to support people's health and well-being and to escalate their concerns. So SA looks at how we recognise and escalate those concerns. Um, and again, you know, I would hope that with your volunteers, they would go through the same robust process as a normal member of staff. So we would understand the community, understand those voluntary groups, understand uh, their roles and responsibilities. We would carry out risk assessments and, and ensure that they're safe to conduct the role. We would look at the sustainability of a project. Um, during the pandemic, all of the airlines came together and they did a project called Project Wingman, where they uh, did a cake and tea shop for all of the NHS staff. So they went into all the hospitals, um, just looking after the staff um you know your volunteers must have ways of escalating concerns but again as a community health and well-being practitioner that's something maybe you could uh be there for um you need to think about your other stakeholders how you're going to work together with that um how you're going to support them again how you'll evaluate them and look at that level of transparency there and then S9 looks at identifying and building upon success um, and then looking at uh, how we come together. So as we look at our projects around health and wellbeing and we look at areas that we need to improve. So if it's, say, for example, um, end of life care, how can we use volunteers within that area? So uh, as we've said, maybe you could have people coming in singing uh I, i've seen people sing hymns to people that are dying uh, which is really nice obviously we've got religious people coming in maybe doing last offerings and last rites we've got people sitting there holding hands so people don't die and pass on their own uh, we've got bereavement services that can sit there and um offer support and counseling to the family members so there's lots of ways in which we could build that success around uh, the care in which we're trying to um, create. Uh, and, and equally, we want it to be as seamless as possible. So ensuring that we can create kind of those, those roles and responsibilities and, and identifying those um, and maybe have some kind of care coordinator that, that can sit there and say, look, this person needs X, Y, Z, and you're able to pull in on all these strings. And care coordination isn't a new concept. It's been around a long time. Um, GP surgeries now are move, have moved, I'm not saying are moving, have moved over to care coordination, where you have um, a care coordinator very much on a level three valve like this, and they hold all the strings. So they know what appointments this person needs, they know what medications this person needs, they know what OTs and all of this stuff. So they coordinate all of this care to make sure it all kind of comes together like a jigsaw. Uh, equally, um, you can analyze the strengths and the success. So looking at what's working, what's not working. Um, again, aligning goals and values across the organizations and yours. That then builds, uh, builds strength. Uh, and that also promotes a cross-sector collaboration. So that uh, promotes the togetherness part uh, and the partnership working. Um, and then from there, you can, again, look at your continual quality improvement and your sharing of best practice. S10 wants you to identify and highlight conflicts between services where this does not uh, work in the interest of the local community or work against the best interests of local assets. So every organisation has conflicts. Uh, they have conflicts of interest. Maybe they have conflicts of opinions. Um, and, and some of that's going to be around education. So you may have 
a conflict of different review, uh, different viewpoints. Um, and we kind of call those ethical dilemmas. Ethical dilemmas exist all the time. But understanding those is really important because part of your role will be helping to manage uh, that. Uh, and that's going to be grasping the, un the uniqueness of your community and bringing those different views together um, and engaging the community to understand what matters to them. Um, so whether that's around health, health education, economic problems, social, cultural interests. We need to recognise the competition and the conflict between services. And we know that all services, in essence, are in conflict with each other or in, or in direct competition with each other. However, there needs to be mutual benefits. I think if we need to work, we want to work in a much more collaborative and open way and sharing of resources, we certainly need to be mature enough to be able to understand what the competition is, how we work. Because ultimately, if we want to benchmark, if we want to learn from each other, if we want to share resources, we have to kind of come together on some common ground uh, and identify ways of working. So looking at how we can work together may be a role or a skill in which you're going to need. You'll need to assess local impact on local assets. So again, there's no point referring all of the people that you're looking after and the family members to maybe bereavement service if that bereavement service is already on its knees. Um, what would be helpful is utilizing other resources, understanding other streams. Um, and for example, we did this with a, with people with ADHD in primary healthcare. Um, we knew, or primary healthcare knew that they couldn't meet the demands. They came up with the right to choose pathway, which was uh, a piece of legislation that was brought out about the right to get the same quickness of treatment as you would for cancer. Um, and then they engaged with other um, organisations. Unfortunately, what's happened is all of those other organisations now are completely full. Um, and, and therefore, this impact has caused a national problem. Um, furthermore, it's now caused a national problem with medication drug supplies. So some of the drugs that are prescribed now are becoming short uh, as well. So we need to ensure that whatever we're doing, it's sustainable, we're able to carry it on, um, and we can make sure that we're not wasting uh, resources, but we're able to use them in a cost-effective way. Um, highlighting those issues, so managing and highlighting issues uh, needs to be done. So if you've got a conflict of interest, declaring those with your leadership team, making sure people are aware of what that interest is, um, so you're being transparent about that. Um, and equally, we want to work in a community personal centered approach or promoting community centered approaches. Uh, and this is ensure this ensures that services are designed around the community's interests and best interests as well in mind. So the way we do that is by involving the community in the decision making, planning and evaluation process. So whatever it is we're trying to implement, uh, getting the community involved in that. Uh, and then again, going back to that continual quality improvement uh, and looking at assets and resources. So just thinking about um, GT2, thinking about the community and how we can use them across our role as a community health and wellbeing practitioner. And here I've given you a reading list. So you've got your reading list, you've got your evidence-based um, resources on here and you've got some concepts and theories what i want you to think about for duty two is that we live in a time when we've got limited resources limited money budgets are being cut all over this place and limited staff and for us as community health and wellbeing practitioners, if we are to evolve as a role and we're there to provide solid information, advice and guidance around health and wellbeing, we have to be, first of all, we have to upskill ourselves in those first two areas. We have to surround ourselves with the right 
expertise and be able to know where to signpost people. But equally, we need to stop overusing resources that don't need to be used. So if somebody doesn't need to go to the doctor, why are we sending people to the doctor? Why can't they go to the pharmacy? Why can't they just look online? Why can't they uh, have those needs met elsewhere? Um, because if we keep leaning on these services at the rate we are, we're just blocking it for people that that do need it when they need it. So duty to then look at those professional practices then um, thinking about your wider curriculum, British values here then, we're thinking about um, democracy, taking part in the rule of law, uh, individual liberties and mutual respect and tolerance. Uh, British values also looks at the decision-making process, promoting and fostering the environment of respect. We've got our prevent strategies, looking at radicalization and reduction of that across communities, so working together. We've got health and well-being, which is at the core of what we're talking about here. So bringing together those health strategies. Our equality and diversity looks at how we're not going to discriminate against uh, the protected characteristics and how we're going to respect cultural differences by promoting inclusivity uh, and by using inclusion across the community to be involved in this. We have our health and safety, which is about obviously looking at um, advice and guidance and safe ways of working and safe ways of recruiting. The information advice and guidance part uh, for duty two looks at helping community members make informed decisions about their health and well-being and points of referral and how to refer on. Safeguarding looks at ways that we can have safe ways of working with volunteers and, and within providing information advice and guidance. And then we have our functional skills which is reading, writing, speaking, listening, and maths, which is obviously through psychoeducation and those other activities. So let's bring in SA2. So SA2 then is um, in a rapidly changing world, we need to collaborate across a different set of boundaries. Uh, it's vital to address these in local and complex issues. So here we're looking at collaboration, partnership building, working with volunteers, evaluating, building successful collaboration and identifying um, the competition. Your essay should draw relevant themes and concepts in the real world. You need to examine these, understand these aspects of health and wellbeing and consider also the ethical considerations uh, of this. Uh, you need to provide a well-structured essay of 500 words. So what I want you to be able to do in a nutshell is just think about your role as an assistant, as a, a community health and wellbeing practitioner and how you would be able to, in your role, whether you're in a residential home, nurse and home community setting, how can you do this within your service? Um, as always, there is the example uh, afterwards. And then next week, when we come together, we're going to start to look at GT3 knowledge. Uh, and therefore, we're going to look at informed information, advice about local services and projects that support health and well-being. So thanks for watching. Uh, if you've got any um, questions or you need any further information, please don't hesitate uh, to reach out to me. And I will see you all in the near future. Bye for now.